Right, greetings. Hello, welcome to the um, Philosophy Club here in La Creuse in France. Um, <clears throat> so this is resuming our normal Philosophy Club in the Sunday evenings after the Mary Magdalene um, event which we had last weekend, which was so, you know, fascinating, um, on the 22nd of July. So now it's the 30th of July. <clears throat> and, yeah, so... Um, it was a fascinating weekend. We had people visit from uh, the States and, you know, people online. We did a very good conference. And thank you again to all the speakers that took part. Um, <clears throat> and I'm in the middle of uploading all that. But we're going to record this anyway and upload it in due course. And once again, we're going to compare and contrast the names of God in Sufism and in Islam. There are 99 names of God, which are the detailed specifications of God's innermost identity, if you want. Um, a friend of mine recently posted something on Facebook about prayer. Somebody said, shall we bring prayers back in schools? She commented underneath saying, well, yes, but prayers to whom? Um, it's a very good question. She happens to be an Israeli, so, you know. But even in Israel, there are many different religions represented. Not every Israeli citizen is is following a Jewish faith, um, there are Buddhists and, you know, Christians and Muslims and all kinds of Baha'is and everything. The whole spectrum, actually, of the periodic table, um, new religious movements and so on. So, so if a public school system, you know, brings prayers in the schools, like, who's going to agree who it should be prayed, prayed to? And the same in America and France and elsewhere and in Britain. So... <clears throat> This, this philosophy club, we're trying to sort of answer and solve that problem. In a sense, it should be to all gods. This is my view. <laughs> and in Hebrew, that will be the Elohim, which is the plural of, of, of God. So the, the gods is Elohim, which are actually, um, you know, in the Bible as the creator of the universe and of mankind. So the Elohim, the gods, creators. But then how many gods are there? So <clears throat> the number is pretty much unknowable certainly unknown. I have an anthropological study of all the gods in all the different tribes of humanity. It's a reference book which I have here. And there's about a hundred thousand god names listed from all the little tribes and so on of mankind throughout the whole of history. <clears throat> but there are infinitely number of more names that weren't recorded from tribes that have gone. Um, and then of course if we're going to start talking about <clears throat> the mathematics of planetary consciousness and how many planets have living life on with language and with religion and with spirituality, then that's probably a very large number. So if we add up all the total number of gods in the entire universe, as Voltaire would want us to do, because he firmly believed in life on other planets, so did Giordano Bruno, um, and so did Carl Sagan and many other cosmologists. Um, then we're talking astronomically large numbers of gods and deities. Um, as I've explained in my book on religious mathematics, which is the um, Philosophiae Religionis Principia Mathematica, it's a se sequel to Newton's book, the uh, Principia Mathematica of Natural Philosophy. I've done the Principia Mathematica of Religious Philosophy. And there's a whole section on there about how we can compute the numbers of gods throughout the universe. I mean, obviously it's speculative, but one can make intelligent speculations. I think all science is based on intelligent speculations that then are proved. It's like a hypothesis. You then work through and prove it or disprove it. That's how science works. And I think that's how religious knowledge works, actually. Um, you know, the great prophets of mankind empirically tested their, their faith in a particular deity. And then that was, you know impressed upon them, now actually this God thing is real. Um, and many of these great prophets have times of doubt. They turn away, they give up, they say, no, this is just ridiculous, I must be going crazy. Even Muhammad had those doubts, but was reassured by his wife Khadija and her uh, cousin Waraka and others many, many times. Then signs and miracles happened in his life that made him feel, no, this Allah thing, this really is something. So, that's all the way of saying we're going to look at the 99 names of Allah 
<clears throat> filtered through the Islamic and, and um, Sufi tradition, each of which has profound roots. And then we're going to compare and contrast them with the Tarot of the Gods, <coughs> of which there are 78 selected. Okay, I'm going to ask my friend and colleague uh, Noah to select the first of the names of the gods that you want us to explore. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> the name is Al Mahid, the majestic one. Okay, that sounds amazing. I can't wait to see old Al Majid, is it? The majestic one. Hmm. Now, that's one of the you know important names. I mean, they all are, of course. But um, for Islam, God is certainly majestic, and the the understanding of God is is that he has this absolute kind of majesty about him. It's it's also a kingly name, and we've just had the coronation of King Charles the the third, which shows us what what majesty looks like if you want. Um, you know, in the uh, royal traditions of humanity. Um, so, <clears throat> God is understood to be the, the king of kings, really, the, um, the sovereign of the universe. And that means that he is the most majestic and the most glorious. And therefore also, the good news is that he is a a resort of last resort if you're being oppressed by human law, by corrupt rulers, by um, people that are misbehaving in positions of power. We can think of many examples throughout the world where this is going on in many countries, many legal systems, there's corruption, there's um, scams going on, you know, bribery is insisted on. Um, and even if there isn't, like, overt bribery, there's a sort of cultural bribery and built into many human beings that they will give preference to their own kind. They'll, they'll not give justice to the poor or the, um, you know, the immigrant or whatever. Um, so if you're suffering from all that kind of stuff, it's really good to know that there is a last court of appeal <laughs> somewhere. Um, and we can dispute and debate about where in Islamic and Sufi tradition, this this majestic one is located. You know where is that sovereign? Um, but the fact is that there is such a sovereign lord, who therefore is the court of appeal if you've been wronged. And through prayer, you can appeal to that now. You don't have to wait till the after death judgment. You don't have to, although that will come, as Kant said that underpins the whole idea of an ethical universe. Without some kind of sovereign God underpinning it all, there's, there's no ethics. The people, the criminals, the steal, stealers, the robbers, get away with it. <clears throat> Nobody can punish them. Well, no, there is a sovereign Lord, and eventually they receive their karmic comeuppance. <clears throat> but through prayer, you can activate that even like in this world. That's what Sufis believe. If somebody's wronged you, whatever, you know, defamed you or stolen from you or done something terrible, then through prayer you can appeal to the sovereign lord of the universe for immediate karmic comeuppance on them. And it will happen. Um, <clears throat> so it's an important um, quality. And I think that's why it's good to have all the... I'm a, I'm a constitutional monarch in my politics. I think it's good to have a constitutional monarch, someone like Charles, that's above all the corruption of political parties. I'm talking about the UK now. We've seen how easy it is for a party like the Tory party to scan the system and totally corrupt it with bribery and with, um, you know, favour and placements to their cronies and elevating just corrupt Tories to the House of Lords because they give money to that party is scandalous, in my opinion. These people aren't real lords. I ran 33 meetings in the House of Lords back in the 90s and noughties, and back in those days, you know, being a lord was quite important, and one took it seriously. I had friends in the House of Lords 
who facilitated my meetings, the late Lord Ennals, whose brother founded Amnesty International, was a good friend of mine, and we did some great meetings, and we invited him members of the Lords, but also um, NGO leaders, um, religious leaders and so on, Sikhs, Sufis in fact, um, came to the meetings, and Buddhists, and it was um, an important discussion around peace and ethics and philosophy. But those days seem long gone, the Lords now just rent a, rent a Lord, you know, you can corrupt. And, and it's because this Tory party has diluted it, and it's appointed like Russian intelligence agent activists. I mean, this is mind-boggling. Boris Johnson corrupted the institution of the Lords more than any other person in my, well, I think in recorded history, actually. Um, <clears throat> and if you, if you work it out why, you understand that Brexit was uh, the brainchild of Russian intelligence under Putin, who, who weaponized British politics using social media to get average British people to think mostly English people, I should say, to think Brexit was a good idea. So that's an example of how high up injustice goes. Um, you know, if Putin and his cronies, including Trump and Boris Johnson, were behind that evil, which is Brexit, which they were, well, who do we appeal to? You know, who's the lord of history? Well, that's where Al-Majid comes in. Um, just as Al-Majid helped inspire the resistance movement against the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan um, when you know, a bunch of like amateurs took on the weight of the Soviet army and won. So I think we have to now take on the weight of Putin's regime as the people in Ukraine are doing. Um, because Putin, after emboldened by Trump and, and Brexit, thought, well, now I'll just attack Ukraine. Nobody will care. But no, we do care. And Al-Majid, the sovereign lord of history, is watching carefully. Um, so that's why it's important that, that um, Sufis understand this. Um, and it's not just Sufis, of course, Christians also believe in the sovereign lord of history. And although, um, you know, evil people masquerade as Christians, like both Trump and Putin and Boris Johnson pretend to be some kind of Christian, in fact they're fakes, they're pseudo-Christians who are working really with the Antichrist, as far as I can tell. Um, and, you know, having a fake faith, um, which is destructive. But the sovereign lord of history um, can see what's going on. Okay, so now, there's Al-Majid, the majestic. What deity are we going to identify with Al-Majid? It's going to be, it's quite an important one, I would say. So from the Tarot of the Gods... Um, Let's see what um, what would be appropriate. <clears throat> hmm. Yes. Well, it's a very good question. Um, hmm. I'm going to go with um, the deity card number eleven, which is Amun, and stands for the Tarot Card of Justice, um, which is the main quality of majesty, sovereignty. And Amun is a sort of hidden god in the Egyptian pantheon. He's not as popular as Ra. He's not as well known as Thoth, who's the god of scribes. He's not as sexy as Isis, the goddess of nature and healing and magic. And he's really not well known except by Egyptologists and people that really go into this. But he actually was the sovereign lord of the Egyptian people. Um, and his, his headquarters was in Thebes, which is like way down the Nile. Um, Ra was based up near Cairo, um, <clears throat> where the great you know, pyramids were. But, but down in Thebes on the bank of the Nile, is where um, Amun was based. Um, he was known as the Lord of the Thrones of the Two Lands. And Thebes became the capital of the whole of Egypt during the New Kingdom period. And at various times it was. When the Greeks discovered it, um, they called it Thebes. The Egyptians called it Wasirt. 
and it was important because the Valley of the Kings was here where the pharaohs were buried when they departed this life for the other world. And the Valley of Kings is on the west bank of the Nile, more or less to opposite Thebes. And many of the greatest pharaohs were eventually buried there. Um, and there were um, queens among them. And, and that was their way of showing their deference to, to Amun, saying, like, I've been a king, I've been pharaoh of Egypt, I've had you know, hundreds of concubines and slaves and whatever, but now I surrender myself to you, Amun. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, All, and in the Valley of Kings, we, we have tombs of Achmose I, um, Ramses VII, Ramses IV, Ramses IX, the sons of Ramses II, um, and this, the Sons of Ramses II has the tomb which has been discovered has 120 rooms in it. Like, so it's one of the biggest tombs ever found in the valley. And Ramses II, thought, you know, very important king, Ramses IX, Mernepta, Ramses V, Ramses VI, and so on and so on. Um, they're all buried in this valley of the kings. So I think that... Our moon, therefore, deserves to be called the sovereign lord of, of history, in effect, from an Egyptian perspective. Um, because the fact that they want to be buried near to Thebes meant they were expected to meet up with our moon in the afterlife and to be judged there. And Osiris was going to be part of the team judging the soul. And these books of the dead, which were often buried or inlaid into the coffins that these pharaohs were buried in. These books of the dead tell them to behave and, and how to, how to like, um, face the trials of the afterlife. Now, you know, in the 19th century, materialist archaeologists um, thought, well, OK, it's interesting psychologically, but it's not, like, true. I think nowadays um, Egyptology has moved on a bit, and, and if you integrate the research from near-death experience that seems to actually happen when you die. People have reported this countless times under clinical conditions which can't be faked. They do have some kind of a judgment experience after death. So I think the Egyptians, I don't know how, but they knew that already. Um, and therefore their Book of the Dead, which guides souls into the afterlife, was based on those empirical experiences. I think they knew because people had had near-death experiences already. Don't forget, Egypt survived as a civilization flourishing for over 3,000 years, which is like longer than the time of Christ since us. Um, and our moon was worshipped all, all 3,000 years and beyond. Um, and during that time, of course, people had had near-death experiences. They'd, they'd died of a coma or they'd had a fatal accident or fallen off a chariot got concussion or whatever, and, and then revived. We know that it was happening because Plato talks about near-death experiences in his book, The Republic. He talks about the myth of Ur, when Ur, an Athenian, had a near-death experience. So I think they had these things. Knowledge of that would have been passed on in the temples, and therefore they put the instructions of the books of the dead into their coffins. Um, also close to Thebes is Nag Hammadi along the Nile to the north which is where they found the Gnostic Gospels and what's I think definitely the case is that the whole Jesus story only makes sense if you factor in the survival of the soul after death and near death experiences but in my reading Christ himself had in effect a near death experience I mean, I mean he was dead clinically but he revived, and that's what a near-death experience means. And then he, you know, survived to tell the story of what it was like in the afterlife. Those teachings were then transmitted orally in, in the hands of certain Gnostic disciples, Thomas, John, Mary Magdalene, and so on. And they came to be written down later in things like the Pistis Sophia and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and the Gospel of Thomas, and that's why it's worth honouring the Gnostic tradition, which in a sense was an Egyptian esoteric Egyptian um, Christian tradition. So <clears throat> Alexander the Great visited Thebes 
He went down there at the time of the Opet festival, which was one of the great festivals. And during the Hellenistic period, the Ptolemies went down and, um, you know, there's a lot of new building going on. The great temples of Amun, Amun flourished there, and they're some of the biggest in the world, the temples of Amun. They're still there in ruined form, but with great pillars and so on. Um, <clears throat> it's also worth recording that Muhammad believed he was part Egyptian by descent, because in his ancestral bloodline was Hagar, an Egyptian princess, who was the consort of Abraham, who he hero worshipped. And so in Muhammad's genes, as it were, was, was the Egyptian royal line who had worshipped Amun for millennia. And although Muhammad didn't know much about Egyptology, a lot of it had been lost by then, he had a sort of intuitive understanding of the importance of justice and, and, and the, the absolute sovereignty of God. In effect, he was an Amun worshipper without knowing the name. Although I have to say the word Amen or Amin in Arabic is, I believe, connected etymologically to Amun. Um, so that, I think, is, is why I would connect these. That fits. Um, it fits, yeah. Also, just mm. to mention, um, Amun was worshipped by the Greeks also as Amun, and he had a temple and a statue um, at Thebes in Greece. And he also had a temple in Sparta, now, the inhabitants of Greek city Sparta were very pious, actually. And they, they also felt Amun was like an international deity. It was bigger than just Egyptian. And there was a famous oracle to Amun in, e in Egypt at Siwa, which is still going. It's a flourishing oracle um, city. And Alexander the Great went there when he went to Egypt and was acknowledged as, as the rightful monarch of Egypt um, and he went to the oracle at Amun to say like who am I the question he asked is who am I and the answer came back you're the son of God you're the son of Amun and that and he became the sovereign of the known world you know the king of kings the emperor um, so I think that shows how the Greeks and the Egyptians both honoured the sovereignty of God, which can then devolve onto individuals like Alexander the Great, or righteous and just um, kings. And I think that gave rise eventually to the idea of a Messiah, which would come to help humanity, save humanity. Lurking behind Christ, the Son of God, is, is Amun, the, the, you know, the hidden sovereign of the universe. But anyway, that's, that's an, a long, another story. Anyway, there we are. There, there's, um, I think, why Al-Majid and um, Abu go together. All right. Okay, thank you. Right, who should we have next? Maybe do it the other way around. Maybe start with a, a tarot, and then we'll select out the appropriate... Um, okay. Name of Allah. Mm. Let's see which tarot and which god comes. King of Earth, Dagda. Okay. Ha. Ha ha. So this is an Irish druid god. I like Dagda. Um, he has a big a staff or club. And he has a big um, cauldron. Um, of plenty, which is great because it never is exhausted. He can feed how many people turn up at his his um, his palace at Tara, and he was the the sort of main anchoring deity of the Tuatha and the the deities that were in Ireland before the humans got there, before the Gaels appeared, and then challenged them for sovereignty. In fact, under their druid Emergin. So Dagda is a, a sort of friendly god. Um, he's like everybody's favourite father or uncle figure, you know, who, who keeps everything running and, and the banquet feasts flowing. Um, <clears throat> like the father in Pride and Prejudice and some of the other Jane Austen novels, he organises the weddings of his daughters. And um, 
make sure that happiness prevails. Okay, um, <clears throat> and he has a few other traits that are important, um, which I'll come to. Now, let's see what, which of the names of God um, we would equate with Dagda. Um, mm. Yes. I just want to add one thing about Dagda, is that he's, he's not a fool. And he realises that, that gods, blokes, the male deities, aren't all powerful in themselves. They need goddesses too. And he, he has as his partner the Morrigan, who is the goddess of ancient Irish sovereignty. So he realises that for a man to be powerful, a man often needs a really good wife or consort or wisdom lover, as I would say. And the Morrigan um, helps him win some crucial battles when the um, Tuatha Dé were fighting even older, like um, divine figures prowling around the Irish landscape. And he um, had a wisdom affair with the Morrigan, which, which then enabled him to win the battle because she gave vital intelligence. So he was crafty enough to know that he doesn't know everything and that he needs a good woman to give him back up as I hope the lesson is well taken by all the men. Um, so, <clears throat> yes. Um, so there's a certain humility in the Dagda which makes him, um, you know, which makes him a, an attractive figure. He's not a sort of know-it-all um, that's got, um, you know, hubris. Um, mm. Yes, I'm going to go for Al Mukit, the nourisher, 51. Um, I have a dear friend in the Sufi tradition called Mukita, which is the female nourisher. And often it's, it's seen as a female thing to be a nourisher and a mother. But it's actually a quality of God, Allah, who is, who is all genders and beyond. Um, name and form. al Mukit is the nourisher of all creation and God has already bestowed nourishment upon all his creation and creatures before even creating them. It's a mystery food and nourishment isn't it? Um, we, we are nourished in so many ways both by physical eating, drink but also every breath we take nourishes our bodies with energy, oxygen which in turn is given to us by plants and trees. It's all a mystery, this life cycle that we live in. We, we don't really even know how water got on this planet. They're discovering water sources on other worlds, and the new um, James Watson telescope has just seen a, um, a planet or a star system forming in a distant galaxy with water actually already forming the planet. So before they thought water comes from outside, uh, bombarded with uh, you know, asteroids and meteorites and so on. But actually they now think water's so plentiful in the universe that it's there from the very beginning. So the water in the earth was maybe already being trapped at the time the planet was forming. Um, one day I hope they invent sort of um, time machines to go back and watch how it was all done. Um, the important point is al the, the nourisher, had already planned all this. Um, and <clears throat> as the lord of all the universes, nourishment is inbuilt into the process. Um, the more higher up the, the, um, the food chain, so to speak, we advance, um, the more the nourishment takes an ethereal or intellectual form or spiritual form. So I think people of a high order and nourished by ideas, by thoughts, by, by inspiration, by music, by colour, by energy. Um, it's been discovered in, in the new field of what's called vibrational medicine that, that healing is achieved largely through vibrational exchanges, colour, light, sound um, and intention. And so we can nourish each other with thought as well as kind words, deeds, um, 
It doesn't have to be a plate of food, you know. Um, and I think al Makit is the nourisher on all those levels as well. All the sacred revelations of humanity, the Quran being a very important one, but not the only one, all the succeeding revelations to mankind are part of our spiritual nourishment from the Creator, who is the nourisher. And, you know, we might say, well, the Irish Celts didn't have such a sophisticated theology as all that. I don't agree. They did. They knew that God, the, the stories that form the Tuathe Danam and their legend cycles, like Luch and Dagda and so on, they represent archetypal forces, which the Druids were in touch with, um, which also the early um, generations of Muslims and Arab prophets were in touch with. It's the same universal archetypes that govern the human condition, I would say. They all knew that nourishment is so important to us. It must be a feature of the divine intelligence that's planned this universe. Um, and also the role that, that women play in that is, is, is vital, not just in giving the mother's milk, but in all the nourishment that, that you know, mothers and women give to um, their children and their lovers and so on. It's through love, ultimately, that we nourish each other. So I think um, al Makit, the nourisher of all creation, would make a great um, equivalent to the Dagda. Yeah, across time and space and across what look like disparate cultures. In fact, it's the same idea, the same archetype. I can see why. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, I tell you what, now you choose another of the names of God and we'll see um, if we can marry him up with an archetypal deity card. <clears throat> the subtle one, Al Latif. Ah, this is one of my favourites. I don't have favourites, but I, I, <laughs> I like the subtle one. <laughs> um, because as an intellectual, you know, we, we work on this level trying to discern the subtleties of existence. And when I was talking earlier about energy medicine and vibrational medicine, that is the new science of the future um, in terms of med med medical healing. Um, I've been reading a brilliant book by Dr. Richard Gerber about this. Um, a good doctor can heal, you know, at that level. And a good philosopher can work out what's going on, you know, at that level as well. Um, yes, Al Latif, the subtle one. It's such a beautiful name. Um, God works at the level of fine detail, uh, delicate, gentle, and beautiful. Um, the finest of the beauties of God are hidden in the innermost secrets of the beauties of the human soul. It's our own subtlety as human beings. We know that we're, you know, in, in our interior spaces, we have access to the subtleties of our own mind and our own souls. Well, God has sovereignty over all that subtlety that's going on in all human souls in the incarnation at any one time and in all animals and, um, you know, in all, inside all cells, all all beings, um, and not just on this planet, but throughout the entire universe. I mean, that is quite an, an enormous um, range of access, let's put it like that. And now, um, <clears throat> you know, so if you think of God as a sort of artificial intelligence, I don't really like the term, um, a cosmic artificial intelligence. So when you ask chat GP a question, you know, how many atoms are there in a blade of grass? I mean, it'll give you a sort of answer, but think of God as the enormous um, cosmic intelligence that can answer any question from anywhere in the entire universe, like accurately and immediately.